Hello, my name is Joel Dunning and I'm here at EAX 2023 with uh, David Waller. Uh, David Waller is an absolute giant of mesothelioma surgery. Uh, he's contributed so much and, and very, very importantly, the incredible trials of Mars 1, MESOVATS and Mars 2. And he has been here uh, in some of these, probably one of the most controversial uh, topics going on right now at EAX. So, Thank you so much for coming to talk to us no and, uh, and maybe just tell us what's been going on at EACS talking about mesothelioma and obviously in the light of these massive new trials. So my job was to review the evidence of Mars 2, as you know, it was first presented at the World Lung Cancer Conference a month ago by Eric Lim. And the headline was that stopping surgery would save 28% of patients and unnecessary deaths. So that was a quite a controversial statement to make. And uh, so what I've done is I've gone through the evidence and uh, just tried to counter that um, headline statement and look what was beneath it. So, so tell us more about how you've dug under that. Obviously, it's been super controversial. You know, a lot of people are talking, calling into question the quality of surgery. I think you did half the cases uh, and also, you know, use of PET uh, and case search, etc. So dig under those That's headlines right. for us. So the major criticisms, I'll, I'll address the major criticisms of the trial and explain why we did what we did. The major criticism was that the selection criteria were too loose and we included patients who probably would not be routinely operated on in other expert centers. So people with non-epithelioid disease, people with clinical nodal disease, and our staging was less than intense than uh, is currently used by expert centers. We did not use PET. We did not stage the mediastinum. As I said, we included patients with non-epithelioid disease. Now, the reason we did that was to ensure recruitment to the trial. And we found in Mars 1, the recruitment was very uh, slow and preclusively slow because we were very selective. And in a way, we got our fingers burnt because we were probably too loose in the selection. So 17% of patients had non-epithelioid disease and less than half had T1 uh, disease. So um, the main criticism is how applicable the results are to contemporary practice. And that's been raised by many of the experts who've seen the publication we've submitted. Regarding the, um, one of the criticisms possibly was the competency of the surgeons, but there were only four major centers and we uh, validated each other. We visited each other's operating rooms. Uh, we had to sign a document saying that we were happy with the conduct of the operation. So we standardized the conduct uh, and we're very happy. And John Edwards uh, has presented this at IMIG that uh, we ha were happy that the quality of surgery was uh, top standard basically and our operative mortality rate was 3.8 percent which is well within limits for that sort of population we were operating on and uh, we set out to achieve macroscopic resection and we only failed to do that uh, in a, about 15 percent of patients so uh, technically that was the best we could do the problem i think was that we were too loose in selection we suffered from poor survival in the non-epithelioid patients. And because we were doing extensive disease, we did large operations, and we found an excess of uh, treatment-related respiratory deaths in the surgical arm, which probably related to the high proportion of patients who had the diaphragm excised and replaced. And we know that is a big physiological insult to patients in their 70s. And there was a high 90-day mortality um, probably related to post-operative pneumonias, the patients had trouble fighting them. So the overall survival was found to be um, better in the non-surgical group in the first uh, two to three years, uh, but that included non-epithelioid. Um, when you go past that, there's no difference in overall survival. In fact, the longest term survivors, uh, the tail to the curve, were patients who had surgery and chemotherapy. Unfortunately, another big criticism of the study, we set out to, the objective was to see if surgery added anything to chemotherapy, but 40% of the patients received no further chemotherapy after surgery. So effectively, in 40% of patients, it was a trial of surgery versus chemotherapy. Also, there was a higher use of immunotherapy, significantly higher in the non-surgical group, 
uh, and we didn't allow for that in the design of the trial because the data was it wasn't being used at that time and unfortunately that probably of course had a significant survival benefit uh, and was more commonly used in the non-surgery group so unfortunately it was a massive achievement and credit to everybody involved yourself included and all the UK centres, the network of mesothelioma nurses um, that promoted and organised the tr two trials units that we used. Um, but I think the problem is going to be in applying the results to real world uh, mesothelioma surgery. Yeah, and, and, and tell us a little bit more where you personally go. You did so many of these operations. Did you do half of them? You did a huge number of these operations. So, so today, right now, what will you be doing next week when you go back to meet mesothelioma patients? So we're still are not sure about the um, use of surgery in early stage disease. And the proposal will be for a MARS-3 study to look specifically at the low-grade epithelioid early stage disease. But in the interim, I'm going back to what I was doing before MARS-2, which is to only operate on epithelioid and only operate on early stage disease, and that will be T1 or T2, and also to exclude nodal disease by doing a mediastinoscopy. And that's why I'm waiting now for a patient I did a mediastinoscopy on last week. If his nodes are negative, I'll offer him surgery, and then followed by adjuvant therapy, which probably will be immunotherapy. So, so I hadn't heard of the concept of a, of a Mars 3. So, so I guess tell us a little bit more about that. I suppose you've highlighted it just there. But yes, I think that's the, the burning question. And still, there's, uh, it would have to be an international study. I've talked to my international colleagues. They're very keen uh, to answer the question, is there a role for additional local control in the form of surgery uh, to what would now be immunotherapy? and it would have to be in selected early stage patients with epithelioid disease, and they would have to have completed induction immunotherapy. So there would be no difference in the amount of systemic therapy in the arms, uh, and we would see if surgery added anything in terms of local control. That's the proposal, and it may not be myself who completes the trial now, but certainly I'll be happy to uh, uh, supervise and, and design the protocol with the, the increasing number of younger generation surgeons who are still operating on mesothelioma around the world and still want to uh, answer this question. And I think for the patients as well, we need to be more specific for them. So let's hope. And I guess in America, you know, mesothelioma surgery is probably a lot more prevalent than the UK. You know, A, what impact do you think Mars 2 is going to have? And B, can, can they join Mars 3? I know. You know, it is difficult to randomise in America, but what impact will this study have in America, do you think? Well, I, think, I don't think it will stop operations in America. I don't think insurance companies will um, rely just on one randomised trial from uh, a different healthcare system with the drawbacks that I've explained. But I think the doubt created by Mars 2 will probably stimulate more interest in a fi a hopefully a final randomised controlled trial. I don't think they uh, could actually ignore the possibility now. I don't think anyone could confidently say there's a role for surgery without a clinical trial. And I think that probably is the final conclusion of any publication of MARS-2, is that there is still uh, a role of surgery to be explored in a further clinical trial. But it would have to be international because of the, the delay in recruitment, and that we compromise that to probably in the UK by including the higher stage patients. So we wanted to be specific about the low, step, low grade epithelioid early stage would have to draw the uh, spread the net widely into the Euro European American and possibly Asian uh, community yeah well fantastic well thank you so much for coming to talk to us I know thank you're super you busy me. you've got another session going in 10 all, yeah. minutes but yeah. but your leadership of mesothelioma surgery worldwide has been absolutely amazing and uh, right, so congratulations thank you very much it was a, a great achievement and credit to Eric as the chief investigator for the supervision of the trial credit to all the surgeons who uh, took on this difficult project and more credit to the mesothelioma community who uh, all, you know, put this trial together. Yeah. Big achievement for the UK. Yeah, an amazing sacrifice for the patients who actually agreed to join a, a, what is a randomised trial. Of course, it's amazing deal. they consented to, in such numbers to such a different arm of the study. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much and uh, we'll let you run off to your session. Thank and you, thank you very, very much, much to thank seeing you. us. Thank Thanks you. So